All righty. Thanks, worship team. Uh, all right, we're going to come to our last one of our series where we're tasting the difference. And Daniel, every chapter, he's uh, different amongst a world that's dark and dying. So we need a volunteer from this section or from upstairs, a volunteer from this section, a volunteer from this section. We are having coffee today. So if coffee is your thing, I, I know that relates to absolutely nobody here. All right, yes, who, come on up. Come on up. You saw your, your hand came up. You're special. Yes, come on up. That's great. Excellent. All right, yeah, come on up. As long as parents are okay with having coffee, it's all good. That's like a, 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 a little baby walks up and says, like, no. All, no, they're not nominating other people. That's not how it works. But Cody, you can come down here if you want. Anybody else on this side to represent the whole side? Oh, yeah, come on up. Come on up. Yeah, great. Sorry, you're right in front of my face. I didn't see it. All right, we have three versions of coffee here. We have the hatch, which has got the, um, I believe that's the one right by the, uh, the, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And um, by the park on the main street. We have Mac, Mac so you kind of have legit, and then you have trying to be legit, Mac Cafe. Not even trying, so hey. And then we have the supermarket, okay? So, uh, I'm not a coffee connoisseur. I've only started having a few coffees this year, actually. So I'm pretty new at this. We were going to have our own church coffee as well, but I thought, nah, let's not, let's not go there. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, see, she even knows what questions to ask. Uh, so afterwards, we do have a coffee van or coffee cart outside, so please come and help yourself to that. Um, today, we're talking about God meeting our weariness. So what better way to overcome your weariness outside of Jesus is coffee. So go ahead and take a, take a guess. You can take a sip, a few sips, to, and what you'll do is you have the, it's stickered in front. You'll put the sticker in front of what you think is, is guessing. Is there lots of sugar in this? I think it was one. Yeah, that's a lot. Wow. Okay, you're going to get this for sure. No worries. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> when I have to go to a coffee place, I have to have the cheat sheet. It's like, what's an Americana? What's a latte? I don't mean, like, what's the real English language we're using here to figure what this stuff is? Is it like a 50-50 guess here? That one tastes awful. Okay. Yeah, There's that that <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that means supermarket. Hopefully that means supermarket, yeah. We don't have anyone here who works at McCafe or The Hatch. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> Am I doing, is it like this? Uh, you can put it in front so that way everyone else can see what you're guessing and they can cheer with you or, you know. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So to get, take, take your best guess. There you go. And that was the middle? No. That's not, that's not how it works, so. I got the impression this was a team game. You're, you're on behalf of them, just like Jesus did. So if you win, they win. If you lose, they all lose. So how confident are we? I'm not really confident. Not really confident. <laughs> all right, let's see, how, let's see how you go here. Supermarket, the hatch. You got them all right. Well done. Good job. All right, we saw, uh, she's still, she, you'll go through all three of these, huh? All right, how confident are you? Not confident at all. All right, here we go. The cafe, correct, and the other two wrong. But one out of three is still good. We'll take that. That's excellent. Good job. If you want to take any of those back, you can. Obviously, you don't want that one. So it was the hatch that you, that you didn't like. Yeah. That was the supermarket one. Oh, you guessed supermarket, but it was actually the hatch, yeah. All right. So how are we feeling? How confident are you? I don't know. You don't have any idea. You obviously know coffee, but don't know the of these three. None? I'm sorry. None. None. They're all correct. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Good job. All right. You please take a seat. Good job, guys. So after we'll have coffee out here, let's just pray. We're going to get into this as Jesus meets my weariness, which probably, I imagine most of us are probably there on some level, right? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for today, and we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our, like, you literally say, Lord, that your burden is light, our burden is heavy, and come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You said that out of your own mouth. So we come today, Lord, hoping and expecting that somehow Jesus will be able to give us rest. 
Lord, it's the middle of the year. It doesn't matter when it is. It seems like at the beginning of the year we're tired, at the end of the year we're tired, and in the middle of the year we're tired. We're always tired, we're always weary, and we come to you, Jesus, and we need more than what we have right now, that our systems of putting together rest, our systems of, of putting together to gain energy just are not right, quite working, and we need more of you, Jesus. So I pray that'll happen right here today as we get into your passage and your text, that you will preach your word to your people, and the Holy Spirit will apply it wherever he needs to do. And so we just give him that space. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to go through today six chapters of Daniel. I know. So it's going to be fun. This is why you're going to need the coffee. Um, so uh, we're going to look at how Jesus meets my weariness, but we're going to, I'm going to take kind of an eagle eye view of this, these chapters. These are all prophetic chapters. Some of you are already freaking out. We've got six chapters of prophetic, and some of y'all are like, man, I've been waiting a whole month and a half for this. Like, this is your jam. You've been analyzing the days and the beasts, and you're like, man, this probably means Trump. This probably means America. This probably means Australia. And I'm going to disappoint you straight away right now <laughs> that I'm not going there. Um, I don't know enough, and I will keen, very keen to preach this after I get to heaven, and Jesus tells me all the answers. <laughs> But I don't have it yet. Um, just like last week, we talked about how Jesus is actually re is represented in Daniel and the lion's den. Like, they didn't know that until after Jesus came. I do believe we'll understand a lot more about Scripture. Some we don't have all the answers to yet, but I still have confidence that Jesus is going to win, right? So we're going to talk about that, um, and I'm going to kind of set you... Uh, we're going to kind of walk through the, the different ways that Daniel is attempting to find rest. Because throughout the different prophetic stuff, he sees angels, he actually meets Jesus, and he's just constantly weary. So we're going to jump into this, and it actually is a bit of a flashback, because it's a different section of the book. And so we have here, starting in chapter 7, verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. That's the guy who had the handwriting on the wall. So he actually goes back a few years ago to set this scene up. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and told the following summary of it. So it starts off with this prophetic thing. Now, that word prophetic, it, it's, it means... It, a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. So I'm not here to kind of set up a, a definition of what you think prophecy is um, and whether it's stopped now or whether it continues on. Uh, what I would just say in this whole space, Daniel is looking for God to give him some supernatural revelation. Uh, revelation. And, and we all do this, right? Do we not like when we're saying, hey, Lord, I, do I buy that house? Do I move to this country? Do I take this job? We're all praying that God gives us information. And that's, in a sense, what prophecy is. You might have a different word. That's okay. Maybe it's divine intel. Maybe it's God just answering prayers. Um, but all of us, I think, in some way, man, I want more of that, God. I want you to speak more in my life. And that, I mean, you're here on Sunday, I'm assuming, not just for a coffee, world class, but you're here because, man, I want God to show me, to teach me, to, to give me more than what I have right now. And so Daniel's sitting here, and we're going to go to verse, the next verse here. So, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. And the first was like a lion had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and set up on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. Now, some of you are like, man, let's go, Kevin, let's go. Oh, just for a little bit, okay? Just a little, just a little salt to tease those people that spent a lot, way too much time on this stuff. I, the, 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 the common interpretation probably of this is that it refers to the four uh, we've, the four beasts refer to the four kingdoms that's already been established in Daniel. Now, I don't know this for sure. I'm taking my best guess here. Uh, we've seen it in the vision. We've seen the, him building the golden statue. We've seen every king trying to have his kingdom last forever. And so there's these four beasts that I think are going to match the same four kingdoms. Uh, but not everyone takes it. Some people take, oh, the lion represents England and the eagle represents America. And so some people take that that way. I... I think it's a bit of a stretch. The, the more common, the, the more normal way to take it is how the context is already set up. So, but hey, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But it's very interesting when you think of the context of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Where he, uh, the first was like a lion, and so Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon was the first kingdom, and that was the statue, the head was gold, right? The face of a lion. And then the second one, uh, and the wings of an eagle, which... If you go back to Nebuchadnezzar, so I think all this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon kingdom. If you go back a few chapters, when he was turned into a cow, it said his hair turned into 
feathers like an eagle. And he was on the ground, on all fours, mooing like a cow, loving life. And it said, and it was lifted up from the ground, set up on two feet like a man, and a human mind was also given to it. So if we look at the only other time in this book that someone didn't have a human mind was Nebuchadnezzar. So that's where I would go with this. We can spend a long time talking about it, but it's not really relevant, I think. So this is, I believe, talking about Babylon, and he goes through all four. Um, but what happens to Daniel though, after he gets this word from the Lord? So it, it goes into, uh, if you remember, so let's go to the next slide. If you remember, as those four kingdoms come, you have, you have Babylon, then you have Persia, then you have Alexander the Great in Greece, phenomenal to read about his campaign, how he conquered everything so fast in three years, and then he died at like 30, and it was split into four kingdoms. And then after that, you had Rome, ancient Rome, also fascinating to study. But we've learned all along that somehow along after that, Jesus was going to come along and set up his kingdom, right? So that was the point of all these four kingdoms are going to try and rule the world, but only one will actually rule the world. It's going to be God. It's going to be Jesus. So we see he finally gets that prophetic space in this. I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. This is actually God. Now it looks like Jesus, but it's not because we see Jesus in the next verse. So just go with me for a second. The Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was white as snow. His hair of his head was like pure wool. We don't see God personified very much because he's a spirit. But in this vision, he's personified as the king sitting on the throne. His throne was ablaze with flames, not swords like the Thrones, movie, episodes, whatever it is. Uh, his wheels were a burning fire. And then we see, then Jesus comes on the scene, verse 13 here. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. This, we could spend a ton on this time. Jesus almost only refers to himself as the son of man. He, he wants to connect with humanity. He doesn't say, I am the Messiah. I'm the Savior of the world. I am the Alpha. I'm basically the son of the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the son of God. He, he might allude to that a little bit, but he actually does this all the time. A son of man. This is why they didn't like him, because he was saying, I'm this guy. The Son of Man who's coming out from the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And so at the end of time, as all things wrapped up, God and his authority is going to bestow onto the person who's like a Son of Man, Jesus. And look what he is giving him. This is super profound because it's shown up all the time throughout this book. And to him was given dominion, honor, and kingdom so that all the peoples, the nations, the population of language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Amen. And we've seen this like, this is our fourth time Nebuchadnezzar said it. He's like, oh, I guess I'll give God credit that someday his kingdom will never end. And then finally, he had, after he moved, he learned, no, God really is serious that he will end, and that his kingdom will never end. And then Darius said the same thing, the same phrases, and finally we see Jesus own it, and he finally gets it. So it hasn't happened yet. Well, probably some interpretations will say maybe uh, around 300, 400 A.D. It, this, this happened. I don't think so. The world was pretty messed up around 400 A.D. I think it's still going to happen. But everyone's going to follow Jesus and worship Jesus. <sighs> okay. We're almost done with one chapter. <laughs> How does this make you feel that Jesus is going to win? Hey, it's great. Amen. How do you think it made Daniel feel? You're like, I don't know if I should answer Kevin's questions. <laughs> the new people are like, why is no one talking? Because you know I bait you all the time. Let's see what. He, so he finds out in this giant revelation. He gets the revelation. He gets the prophetic stuff, and he finds out it's good stuff. In verse 15, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my head kept alarming me. He finds out Jesus is going to win. And then all of a sudden, depression hits him like a ton of bricks. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I can handle this. Why is there the disconnect? He doesn't have rest. His soul is weary. It's almost, and this is, this is actually counterintuitive. We preach against it all the time. Or we preach the other way, which is, hey, as long as you know Jesus wins, it's good. Yeah, there's a death in your family, but they're a Christian. Hey, Jesus is going to win in the end. Therefore, it's okay, right? No, it still stinks that my relative died. I'm still not happy, right? Well, I wonder if knowing Jesus wins in the end isn't enough to make you not weary anymore. Because it didn't work for Daniel. Now, maybe you're better than Daniel, and you're more mature than Daniel. Maybe so. 
but we're, there's some disconnect between my head knowing he wins in the future, and right now life kind of stinks, and I'm so tired. So maybe there's something else that we need. And so let's go to verse 16 here. And Daniel is going to see some understanding. I approached one of those who were standing by and began requesting of him the exact meaning of all this. Probably some random angel or some epiphany in the dream. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So now he's going to find out the interpretation. Maybe that's what we... It's one thing to get some stuff from the Lord. It's even better if I know what it means. And he's going to tell him what it means. He goes through this stuff. Verse 17. These great beasts, which were four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. Verse 18, we'll go through this pretty quick. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom. Uh, I know we're kind of walking through this. You need to see this. This is about you in the dream for the future. The saints of the highest one, that has to be us, who will receive the kingdom and take possession of the kingdom forever for all ages to come. You're actually going to, in the new heaven, new earth, and Jesus gets it from God. He's not going to be like, ha it's all mine, and you're all my slaves. I tricked you into believing in my death and resurrection so I could be, get here and I could torment you forever and ever. No, he turns around because he loves you so much. He's already given you eternal life. Now he wants to give you also part of it, part of the inheritance. Amen. Verse 28 he says, oh, do, wait, do, I think, yeah, sorry. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole earth will be given not just to Jesus, but to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be everlasting kingdom, and all the emperors will serve, all the empires will serve and obey him. So he finds out Jesus wins, and then better yet, guess what? I win as well. Nice. Now we can stop our being weary, right? Like it's one thing if Jesus wins and I lose, and uh, like yay. But I want to win too. It's just part of human nature, right? So Jesus wins, I'm going to win. Now my life can be good. I can finally feel rest. I can finally be where Jesus wants me to be. Is that, that's where you're at, right? Because you believe that God wins and you win too, right? Shame on you for being weary. Shame on, no, I'm just kidding. So Daniel, he finally, he gets to go on vacation and, and have the, we'll just stop there with the illustration, Kevin. Let's go to verse 28, see what's his response. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me and my face became pale, but I kept the matter to myself. What? I don't know about you, but that's what I've been taught all my year at church. Hey, as long as we know Jesus wins, that's all we need. And I find out I win, and it's still not working for Daniel. So maybe we have even more disconnect. Maybe it's, I need to know other things too. And so we go to the next chapter. All right, that was chapter 7. That's the longest chapter. What else do we need then? Chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. So last time it was the first year. This is the handwriting on the wall, king. This is the third year. This is also the year that the handwriting happens and then he dies and the next king takes over. A vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. He's like, you need to know this is a different one. And then he goes into the whole thing. I'm not going to go into all of it, but we see he got the good news. Now he's going to hear some bad news. Because maybe the answer is, I just need more knowledge. If I just knew more, like if I knew the future, you would be happy, right? You wouldn't be worried. If you knew the future, I don't know about you, but I think the less I know, the less I'm worried about. And he, Daniel's going to see this. God's like, hey, you, you're so worried. You want to know more? Okay, let's do it. I'm going to show you something else. Instead of how, well, things are going to be good, but things are also going to be pretty hectic. So verse 11, we come to this. It even exalted itself to be equal with the commander of the army, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was, was overthrown. He's going to be talking about the Antichrist, because we see removing the sacrifices in Revelation that talks about the Antichrist, right? Some of y'all love to talk about the Antichrist, trying to guess who it is. Trump, Biden, you know, Palaszczuk, like whatever it is, the queen, the king, my sister, like it just whatever it is. It's, you know, I remember growing up and being like, the Antichrist could be already alive. What if it's the guy at the grocery store? I was like, well, then it is what it is. What, am I supposed to kill him or something? Hey, what? So, 
it even exalted itself as the commander of the army. Remove the sacrifice, verse 12. And because of an offense, the army will be given to the horn all along, along with the regular side, and it will hurl truth to the ground. You see, already that happening to some degree. We don't care about truth. We'll just throw it aside. And it does as it pleases and be successful. It talks about that phrase because Nebuchadnezzar and Darius both did that. It did what pleased them to be successful. So the Antichrist will have the same kind of spirit. It's about me and my kingdom taking away from Jesus. And we have a big debate. Who is the Antichrist? Well, let's just stop for a second because I know this matters to some people. Is it in the future? Has it already happened? Because there's different ways of viewing it. Pre-mill, pre-trib, post, like, anyway. We don't need pre-mill, post-mill, and all the sketchy, sketchy stuff in between, and, and who knows. So there's these... There's a guy called Antiochus who shows up about 100 AD, right? And he's a terrible dude. In fact, they, all, they say Hitler was bad. This guy was on the same level as far as persecuting the Christians and actually removed the sacrifice. So some people say it was that guy back then. Let's put it on the next screen. So maybe it's Antiochus from 100 AD, or maybe it's Antichrist in the future. Well, which one is it? Maybe it's both. Maybe. I mean, it looks, it looks the same to me. <laughs> I know, I'm just a guy from, I'm just a guy who loves Jesus. Okay? I don't really know. But I do know that God likes to do things a lot that's the same. He destroyed the whole world through flood. And he, one man rescued humanity. And then we're going to see, he likes having one man rescue humanity in Jesus. And at the end, he's going to destroy the world through fire rather than water. We see uh, he has 12 nations that he chooses, that he loves to rise up. And then he has 12 disciples that he chooses to love and rise up. And, you know, one kind of fails and all that kind of stuff. But we see this, this God likes to do things the same way. And it's very possible, I believe, that there's a lot of things in the Bible that are double prophetic. That God likes to do that because he likes poetry. He likes weaving stories together and some things are totally new. But, so I don't know. It could be both. It could be one. It could be none. But it doesn't really matter because what is Daniel doing? So Daniel finds out this horrible guy is coming. How do you think he responded from that? Verse 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Behold, some standing before me was like, was on who looked like a man. Verse 16, and I heard the voice of a man of a, I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. So he's pretty stressed out. We're going to see later. He's learning about the Antichrist. Didn't help his weariness, by the way. Just kind of news flash. Some of y'all, are, some of us, spend too much time wondering about the end times that we miss Jesus now, and that's super important. And so, guess what? This guy comes to him, Gabriel. You've heard this guy before? This is the same angel. Well, unless there's two Gabriels. It could be. Probably not. It's probably the same guy who shows up to Mary. Lord, all I need is a divine experience. If I just have an angel, I know it's not 1990. That was like the thing in the 90s, at least in America. I wasn't here in the 90s, so I don't know. But in America, we had TV shows touched by an angels. Who's your guardian angel? And, and if, if I could just meet angels, it was all about this experience of angels. Now it seems like it's not as big of a deal. But if we, maybe that's you, but probably most of us is like, man, if I just can have some divine intervention from the Lord and just this super religious spiritual experience, then I can finally get back to where I need to be and have rest. So Gabriel, the archangel, shows up and he's like, I'm going to explain this vision to you, bro. And so he says, and he goes on to the, to the vision and he, again, there was four Things and we see the four things match up with the same things. Let's go to the next slide, verse 17. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. And as he said to me, Son of man, understand, no, he's a son of man. Jesus says he's the son of man. Understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Verse 18. So, and while he was talking with me, I was dazed, my face to the ground. He touched me and made me stand in my place. I want you just to kind of put this in the back of your head for a moment, that the angel touched him and picked him up. Imagine actually being touched by an angel. You know what's going to happen on Sunday? Kevin, move aside. I got something I got to share with everybody. Right? That, that, that's you for a solid month on that high. Facebook status, I'm going to write my book, Touched by an Angel, bestseller. Like, you know it's going to be good, right? 
So what happens with Daniel? So he explains the vision here real quick. So before we start thinking it's Australia, the ram which you saw and the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Yeah, we got that. And the next one, the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece and a large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And verse 23, so he's going to tie this in with the Antichrist. In the latter period of their dominion, when the wrongdoers have run their course, a king will rise, insolent and skilled in tr intrigue, which is referring to the Antichrist, I think. But, I mean, who knows? Who really cares? Verse 27, and then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Oh. Now, if you were touched by an angel, you'd be just fine. Because we're spiritually mature and we can, hand, like, we can do that, right? This is Daniel. And I think what we're meant to see not is all the details about the prophecy, and I'm not trying to negate that. I'm not diminishing it. It's super important. It shows us that God is in control over whole nations. He's over control of all human history. And when I was a kid, that mattered a lot. Like, I was like, he, it made a huge impression on me when I knew that Jesus knew the future because they were coming in the week before he was going to die, Palm Sunday, and he was like, there's going to be a donkey tied to this post and go talk to her. We're going to do the Lord's Supper there. And I was like, no way. Jesus knew that? I was like 10. And I was like, I'm with this guy. If he knows the future, I'm with him. Part of that we're supposed to get, like, man, he knows entire kingdoms before they even show up. And he's going to do what he wants, and he's going to work this all out for his glory and for his kingdom. He's going to win in the end. And then there's this guy, Antichrist, who's going to show up and try and stop it. But Daniel, this wasn't enough. He knew all of this, the good and the bad. He's been, had this amazing spiritual experience that he could do a lot with, and he's exhausted and sick for days. Does that feel like you sometimes? And man, I just, like I'm doing Christianity, and I get this, but I'm so tired. And I'll be honest, I'm a bit of a hypocrite, okay? I'll be, first, I have been really tired this week. But Lord, I'm preaching on weariness. It'd be nice if I could not be weary, so I'm a fraud, okay? I'm still weary, but I think God has an answer here. And he called out and said, uh, can we go back a slide just a second real quick? So this is Daniel, so I didn't realize, we, I didn't finish this first here. So I exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision that there was no one to explain it to me. That's crazy that he said that. Because Gabriel just showed up and did What? Yeah, that's why I put verse 16 back up here. Look what, it, this is how it, the whole thing started. Go to the next foot. So this is verse 16. Go to the next slide. I put it in that order, that way we could see it. So that may be why it's confusing. But there's no one to explain it. And then verse 16, yes, so here it is. It says, Gabriel explained the vision that meant the same exact word. All right, so Daniel, it's like, he gets this explanation. He gets the explanation. And then he's like, oh man, if only someone could explain it to me. I can't relate to that at all. <laughs> so I love you guys. I'm not throwing you under the bus. Um, this is like a teacher, right, who goes to school and says, all right, we're going to learn 1 plus 1 equals 2. And we teach 1 plus 1 equals 2. Here's the 1 pi plus 2 pi equals 2 pies. 1 block plus 1 block equals 2 blocks. Caleb's block plus Sue block equals all these blocks, 2 blocks. And then they go home and like, what did you learn? I don't know. And they have the math problem. And the math problem is 1 plus 1. And you're like, Dad, I don't know the answer to this. But your teacher explained it. No, she didn't. But you've, yeah. And I think we are, we're so finicky as humans. We may even, if God were to give us even what we think we needed, we'd still be super confused. Like, it's like we give ourselves more credit than we need. It's like when someone says, man, I'm going through this hard time. If I only knew why. God, why did you let this happen? Your cry really isn't, Lord, why I just need to know more. Your cry really is, Lord, I don't like this. I want out. I think we think we have a quest for more knowledge. And if I know more about God and theology, if I know more about the Holy Spirit, if I know more about the Bible, then I'll be fine. But I think that's a bit of a, a lie that we put ourselves in, that we don't need those. Those are good, and all this is good. We need more prophecy or divine or dream, whatever you may put in that box. We need more of that. We need to know the future. We need to know God's character. We need to know more information. We need to have spiritual encounters. Like, we need to go on the camps. We need to have good worship. We need to have all this stuff. I'm not saying any of this is bad. I'm just saying if that's what you're going to, to finally get to, you're, it's not going to work. Because it didn't work for Daniel. 
So you know what he does next? He pivots. Let's, that's not working. Let's go a different direction. And so verse chapter 9 goes across this. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you a summary. It's a prayer of repentance. Get us back to Israel. He's in the Bible. He starts seeing the dates. He's like, we're supposed to be in captivity for 70 years. This is year 67. So I'm going to start praying that God remembers we're supposed to go back in three years. And so he does. He starts praying. And it's a prayer of repentance. And this is what we need, right? It's like, okay, that's all. But I got to go back to my own heart, Lord. I got to repent. So he repents for his fathers, his forefathers, for his sin, even though we haven't really seen much of it in this book. He prays, and then the Lord, and there's this prayer of hope, Lord, get us back to there. And if we could only get back to there, and I've cleaned my heart up, then I can finally have rest again. If I can only get back to Texas. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is where I mean, so many of us live our life and our prayer like, Lord, I don't have peace and rest because I don't have it. Or I'm not there. I'm not at that destination. I haven't arrived there. And if I get there, everything's going to be fine. Has that worked in your life so far? Okay. So maybe, maybe this isn't going to end the same way either. So I'm going to skip 20 verses here to get to where he shows up with another angel. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. slide there. Well, I was still speaking in the prayer. He's in the middle of the prayer. And God's like, okay. Like, it's great. God loves it. It's awesome. We need people praying for future stuff to happen. We need people praying prayers of repentance. While I was still speaking, the man Gabriel, Gabriel shows up again. He could see Gabriel twice. Man, if I could just see him once, I'll be happy. Whom I seen the vision previously came to me in my... Why is it, like this is why I think this, this is why I've taken the direction because it shows up throughout the, all these chapters. We're meant to see this. Because he could just say he just showed up and he had a bad day, he was tired, he didn't sleep. His kids were up late that night, you know? And why are we playing dominoes at 4 a.m., dude? We're supposed to be sleeping. Well, I thought, you, I knew you'd be asleep, Dad. That's why I could get away with it. Oh, no, it's not how it works. Then you're grumpy. I don't need to go here. It came in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. So he, this hasn't worked. Even the heart of repentance and, and what was the other part? Heart of repentance. I have to go back to fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. The end game. If I can get the end game and my heart right, that hasn't worked for him. And actually, they start packing up. Like they, they start organizing and he doesn't, he's like 86 when they start to go back and he's like, uh, that's a young man's game. So Ezra, Nehemiah, those guys, they go back. Zephaniah, they go back and they do that. So anyway, Chapter 1, sorry, not chapter 1, verse 1 of the next chapter. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so it's a couple years later, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar, the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him. And the message, so he's, we don't actually see what this is. It's an unknown vision, but we know the context. The message was true. My Bible-believing Baptist brethren is like, yeah, it was true. We need truth. And then the next part was, it had great conflict, my revelation lovers like, yeah, man, I have to have that in there. And it underst understood the message and had understanding of the vision, the prophetic type of people, the more Pentecostal, like, yeah, I got to have some of that. This has everything. What if, and this is maybe what we're missing. Maybe, maybe we're, we only have those little silos of how we engage with God. What if we put it all together and we have all of this? We have prayer and repentance. We have praise. We're looking for the future. We see God, man, I want to see Jesus lifted up. I, I know that I'm going to win. What if we put all that together in church and finally that's what's missing? So are you doing that in your life? Putting it all together? Well, you should. Because <laughs> look what happens in verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, oh, no, had been mourning for three entire weeks. He's not doing great at all. He doubles down, and he's like, I know, we've got to put it all together. And I'm all for balanced Christianity. I, I'm a huge believer that we have... We can learn from every church and every denomination and everyone has a, op I don't believe that you know, all roads lead to Jesus, entirely different fraud, but I believe that we all have a relation with God. I can learn from everybody, but just because I put the right mechanisms together doesn't mean I'll find rest, right? What did, remember that verse we prayed at the very beginning? What did it say? Okay. <laughs> no one answered my, yeah, that's right. No one wants to ask my question anymore. When it says, uh, those who come to me, I will give you rest. 
We've done all of this. And the one thing we haven't seen is actually engaging with Jesus. So look what happens in verse 5. I raised my eyes, looked, behold, there was a man dressed in linen whose waist had a belt of pure gold, of whatever that is. And we see this is going to be Jesus. We see he's, he's described very similarly in Revelation. He's got a few more verses here. His body was also like topaz. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet were like gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. In Revelations, it changes the sound of a multitude to a sound of many waves crashing. He's got a thunderous voice when he speaks. He's also a shepherd, so I'm assuming if that's too scary for you, he can meet you where you're at and speak very nice and calmly to you as well. He's Jesus. He can do it. But as far as the commander-in-chief who's going to conquer the world, this is the guy I want. And so what does he say to Daniel, verse 7? Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great fear fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. Does that sound familiar? Like Paul on the road to Damascus, he meets Jesus and everyone else kind of is aware, but they're too scared. They don't see it. Daniel sees this because God likes doing the same thing twice sometimes. It brings him joy to do that. He's so creative, he can get away with that. And so they all run away. Verse 8, so I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my complexion turned to a deathly pallor. Pallor? What, how do you say that word? Oh, well, you all know that. Okay, great. <laughs> I mean, I knew that. Just making sure you're awake. Everyone passed the test. For you. And I retain no strength. Do you see how we're meant to see this over many chapters? So he's got no strength. I mean, he's got all these visions, right? And Gabriel's showing up, and he's just at the point, like, can you just imagine him just like, oh, dude, I can't do this. Time out, bro. I'm too tired. I don't need another vision. Please, the last thing I want is more revelation, more prophecy, more understanding, more divine experience. I don't need any. I just need a break. I need a holiday. And so Jesus there, verse 9, but I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. <laughs> Jesus is like, just sleep, bro. Let's start there. Because sometimes all you need is just actually to go to sleep, because in our humanity, it's there. I'm not saying that's the only issue why you're weary, but that's maybe one issue why you're weary. Is, and so Jesus, before he goes on and meets him and deals with it, he says, you just need to take a sleep, except for on Sunday morning. No, I'm just kidding. You can sleep on Sunday morning too. That's fine. And miss church if it means you're meeting with Jesus. Verse 10. And then I, behold, a hand touched me and shook me on my hands and knees. I think we're supposed to see a bit of Nebuchadnezzar here too. Nebuchadnezzar on his hands and knees. And Jesus touches him, shakes him, and he's going to pick him up. Verse 11. And he said to me, Daniel, you who are treasured. Do you know that's, I don't think he's think, thinking about just for Daniel. I think that's for you and I as well. I don't think Jesus in heaven's like, there's Daniel in the trophy case and there's all these other plebs that kind of found their way in here somehow. <laughs> right? Do you believe that? Like, I mean, you're treasured. It's not like, notice, it's put on to him. It doesn't say you are a treasured being, like you're, you are treasure. He doesn't say, you are treasure, you're not God, you're not everything rolls around you because you're so important, but you are treasure, it's put on you, that Jesus looks on you as a treasured piece. <clears throat> kind of like that thing that you have that maybe belongs to your great-grandmother that it doesn't have value to other people, but it values to you because of the relationship and the context and the memories. She's like, man, I treasure you. Like, there's not a lot to treasure here, God, I think, but it's yours if you want it. So he meets him there and says, you're treasured. I think some of us probably just need to camp there this week, but we'll keep going. Understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand at your place, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken the words to me, I stood up trembling. Can you imagine meeting Jesus? That would be absolutely crazy. And then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel. And he kind of weaves in these different, different things. I know you're worried about the future and the Antichrist and how this all plays out, but don't. That's not of Jesus to be worried about the future. Maybe some of y'all are so weird because you're worrying too much about the future. And Jesus is like, yeah, but I'm here, right here with you right now. And tomorrow I'll be right here, right with you, 
right then. A year from now, I'll be right there with you. Eventually, 40, 50, 80 years, when you're dead, I'll be right there with you again as well. Don't be afraid. And that you, I know, don't be afraid, that for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding. No, it's good to understand. It's good to figure it out, to have knowledge and the prophetic stuff and to, to pray and the repentance and on the humbling of yourself. So he prayed the prayer. God values that. But we start to worship the mechanism and that's why we have this disconnect between I know the future and I know Jesus, but I don't have rest because I start to do the mechanisms rather than starting to know Jesus and be with Jesus. And your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. Verse 13. But the prince of kingdom of Persia, I almost didn't include this, but because it's pretty interesting, I did it. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in my way for 21 days. Jesus is actually doing warfare on the planet before he shows up as a baby. That's fantastic. That's fascinating. And behold, Michael, another archangel, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. He's, he's doing work. Even when it may look like he's not being with you, he's still working behind the scenes. Verse 14, 15. When he had spoken to me according to his words, I turned my face to the ground, became speechless. Then I opened my mouth, verse 16, and he said to me, who was standing for him, my Lord, due to the vision and anguish uh, has come, I have retained no strength. He's like, we've got to stop this. I literally am going to die. I'm so exhausted. I'm so weary. How does Jesus meet his weariness? Verse 17. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? He's like, I, I don't even think we should be speaking. As for me, there remains just no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. You get the point where he's at? Okay. Then this one with human appearance, so it's Jesus, the Son of Man, touched me again and strengthened me. That's it. It's almost too basic. It's almost too simple. Well, I just have to, I can't actually do it. I just need Jesus to touch me. He does do more things though. He said, you who are treasured, do not be afraid. Peace be to you. Take courage and be courageous. Notice, don't, it's not saying, Put more courage within you. He's like, I have courage for you, so take it. I have rest, so here it is. He gives it. He touches him. Now, as soon as he spoke to me, I felt strengthened. And he says, my Lord, speak for your strength. It, sorry, I said that too fast. May my Lord speak for you of strength in me. He's like, I feel so good now. Let's go. What's the next vision? We can keep it rolling. We can do another 12 chapters. I'm 87, but let's go. Like, it's, a, it's miraculous. And he takes a moment to stop all that other stuff, which is good, it's important, we need it, but just to be with Jesus. And some of us are overcomplicating Christianity so much to just take a moment when you're in your car and just imagine Jesus being in the seat next to you and have a conversation with him and just feel his peace. Maybe you're too busy and you need to take time on the toilet. Put the phone away, put the magazine away and say, Lord, I know we're in a weird position here, but I'm just praying and just, I'm just talking to you. Maybe it's as you wake up in the morning before things get crazy and you take a moment to just imagine Jesus sitting there on the other side of the bed. And you're like, man, what are we going to do today? Whatever comes up, I want you to be part of it. Every encounter, every situation, every thought, man, Lord, help me to be with you. Thank you that I'm treasured. And I want to treasure you too. Show me how I can do that better. And it's just being with him. It's not overcomplicated Bible study. It's not overcomplicated quiet times. It's not singing a certain song. It's just being with him. My Lord, speak. Let's go. I'm feeling better. And he says in verse 20, I think it's a really profound question. Do you understand why I came to you? He said, you know, I didn't really come to tell you all the prophetic stuff. I came here right now because I just want to give you strength. I want to be that place where you can bring your burdens and your heavy stuff and I can give you rest. And so he, he's like, okay. You're good. Like, I don't have to give you more prophecy right now because you're strengthened. He was asking for more, but he's like, you're good. You've, you've got rest with me now. But I shall return to fight against the prince of Persia. <laughs> Let's go, Jesus. So I'm leaving, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. It's almost like Jesus like, man, I can't wait. 
we've been working through all this prophetic stuff with all these kingdoms coming and we'll get through all of them eventually the kingdom of the church will come on and eventually after that the kingdom of Jesus will actually reign Jesus is excited and then we have where sermon's not over there I know you're ready for coffee and you probably need it after this but chapter 11 a whole lot of prophecies though we just got done with that and all that was cakewalk that's, that's grade 1 you move to grade 11 and this stuff it's a lot of prophecy stuff a whole lot of minute details. 45 verses of minute details that should probably make Daniel feel scared and anxious. Why is that chapter there? I, I'm going to take a guess here. I wonder if it's almost just a test. Now, there's debates about what that is, and it probably is talking about actual kingdoms that were around 200 or 380, whatever, or BC, I mean. And it's just so ridiculously over the top. Like, this kingdom's going to come off this hill. And like, well, why, okay, why do we need to know that? And I wonder if, if he's just saying, Daniel, are you going to lose me in amongst all this stuff? And Daniel doesn't. There's not a single time in the rest of the book that Daniel shows up and says, I'm weary or anxious anymore. So he can be around whatever God's doing. And he doesn't lose Jesus in that. Let's go to verse 1 here. And it gets pretty, this is chapter 12 of verse 1. Now at this time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress as never occurred since there was a nation till that time. So people will think, well, that's either 100 BC or it's uh, the Great Tribulation or it's referring to both. And at that time, your people, everyone is found, written in the book, will be rescued. He's like, Daniel, you probably should be really scared of this. And I'm going to win. And Daniel still stays focused. He doesn't lose sight of it. And so we're going to come to these last few verses just to close off with. But as for you, Daniel, so this is still Jesus talking. Gives them the But for you, Daniel, keep these words secret, sealed up in the book until the end of time. Many will roam about. Knowledge will increase. Verse 8, but as for me, I heard, but did not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He doesn't need to know. He's just curious, but that's good. The knowledge is good. And Jesus' response to this, it says, Go your way, Daniel. Go your own way. For these words, because he's like, Daniel, it doesn't, you go do you with me, and I'll take care of the rest. People are trying to figure out this book for the next two and a half thousand years, which has been happening up to date. And he's like, Don't worry about it. You just, you just you go your way with me. That's my encouragement to you. Is you go your way with Jesus. Maybe it's slightly different than someone else's way. Don't judge them for how they're walking with Jesus. I I like to spend time doing Jesus here at this place. It kind of makes me, I don't enjoy doing that. But maybe for you, it's somewhere else. Maybe it's on the toilet. I'm not judging. Don't judge people how they're going their way with Jesus. But you have to go with Jesus. And then you finish the same, same thing. Verse 13 says the same thing. But as for you, go your way to the end. Run the course. Run the race. With Jesus, then you will rest and rise for your allocated portion at the end of the age. It's like, you'll get what you get and you don't get upset at the end. That's what he's basically saying. <laughs> You're going to get treasure in heaven. Your work matters. What happens matters here. So I'm just going to go back to this verse 19 to, as we pray because I want this to be the last thing you see on the screen when Jesus tells him, you are treasured. Do not be afraid. Peace be to you. Take courage and be courageous. We know how it's going to end. Jesus wins. And we win too. There's going to be an antichrist who will do some bad stuff. Great. Bring it on. Let's go. I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm not worried at all. So you don't need to be worried. But take courage. Now, as soon as he spoke to me, I felt strengthened and said, may my Lord, let's keep going. That's my prayer to you. Be strengthened with Jesus. Just spend some time with Jesus. Maybe you need to sleep first. Take a nap. Meet with Jesus. And that way you can say, Lord, what's next? Where are we going? I'm keen. Let's go. Let's run the whole race with you. Every year counts. Every moment counts with you. And I'll see, and we'll do, and we'll get the reward when we get to heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you know the future and that you're in total control of the future. We don't have to worry about it at all. I pray, Lord, that you will look in our hearts and maybe there's some mechanisms of Christianity that we've started to slowly worship, slowly to idolize, that we might find what we're looking for there rather than find it in Jesus. 
Lord, and we believe that there's nothing greater than Jesus. He can fulfill every need and satisfy every desire. And Lord, we need more of Jesus in our life. So I pray you'll open up the cavities of our heart and our mind and our soul and expose those places, Lord, that, we don't, that Jesus isn't giving us rest. And I pray, Lord, you'll miraculously touch us somehow in some way, that we can feel your presence, that it can wash over us like a cool waterfall in, the, in a hot day just to refresh our soul that we might have the courage to lay our burdens down because you've asked to carry them for us. We don't have to. We just get to walk hand in hand with you and you're going to carry the backpack for us. And we praise your name. And that name we pray in Jesus' name, amen.